Hey everyone, before we jump into the video, I wanted to hit you with some statistics, because who doesn't love a good stat? So, this graph shows my change in subscribers in the past month or so, and then that change has actually been exactly zero subscribers. This might have to do with this next stat here, which shows that more than two out of three people watching right now are not subscribed. So drop a sub, and most importantly to me, leave a comment. Somewhere around 5 or 6 hours of editing went into this video and you can expect similar numbers from other ones as well. So what I want to see from my community now is essentially whether that was time well spent. Let me know if you want to keep seeing more content and I'll keep making it. Without further ado, let's get into the video. What up homies? In case you didn't know about this, in each of my videos since sometime in January, there has been a link in the description for a short survey that you can fill out to make suggestions for the channel. I mention this because recently a viewer has requested more chess content. Since I talked about how the pieces move and how to set up the board last time, I decided that for this video I would discuss a couple of questions I like to ask myself to improve the accuracy of my moves and reduce blunders. So what is a blunder? Essentially, a blunder is just a really terrible move, oftentimes so terrible that a good enough opponent can win the entire game as a result. To give a little more context, I want to briefly discuss the different levels of how accurate a move is. So to show you all some examples of the different levels of accuracy in a move, I'm going to do a quick analysis of a game I played against Ludwig, the Twitch streamer, Among Us Extraordinaire and Best Buddies with Saikuno. Well, a computer pretending to be Ludwig, technically. Now, in this picture, I want to direct your attention to this little section over here. I'm going to explain the difference between good moves, inaccuracies, mistakes, and blunders. Good moves are basically moves that, at the very least, don't really make things any worse for you. A steady stream of good moves will usually keep you in the winning position in a game of chess, at least until you begin to play against very skilled opponents. These moves often improve your position, win material, and make things harder for the opponent. Okay, so here we have an example of a good move. This move opens up a diagonal for the bishop on c1. It grabs space in the center of the board and restricts the opponent, and it protects the pawn on e5. Next up we have inaccuracies. An inaccuracy is essentially a weak move. It may not be a major issue in the long term, and it might not even have any serious consequences, but there were definitely better alternatives. Here we have what the computer engine classifies as a mistake, but in the context of this game would perhaps be better defined as an inaccuracy. This move does come with the benefits of giving the bishop on c8 an additional diagonal to work with, and it also gives the queen more space to move on the d-file, but the bishop already had a nice square to move to on b7, and this pawn is free to be taken by the white pieces as well, so doing this move wasn't really worth it. Now we will talk about what are called mistakes. In short, a mistake is a move that immediately worsens your position. Here we can see Ludwig make a move that the computer engine considers a blunder, but for this video it would be easier to define as a mistake. Ludwig takes the white knight with his pawn, but by doing this he leaves the rook to be taken by the white pawn. If you recall from my last chess video, rooks are more valuable than knights, so this is not a good trade for the red pieces. However, it should be noted that if the red king were to have taken the white pawn, the white knight could then jump into the a6 square with check and would still be traded for the red rook. Therefore, the real issue with taking the knight with the pawn is that it doubled these red pawns, giving the red player a crippled pawn structure and nothing else to really work with. Finally, it is time to discuss blunders. A blunder is considered a very bad move that could even result in immediately losing the game. Here is a move that the, that the computer engine considered a mistake, but for the sake of this YouTube video is worth looking at as a blunder. So, what makes this move a blunder? Well, for the move we considered an inaccuracy, it was not a worthy move, but it at least had some benefits. For the move we considered a mistake, it led to a worse position for the red pieces, but still held on to material as well as possible. What makes this move a blunder is that there are no redeeming qualities of the move. Not only is there not even one good reason to do this move, but it also wastes an entire bishop with no compensation. 
the white queen can easily move to f4 and take this completely unprotected bishop, and the red pieces have effectively made a move that served purely to help the white pieces and did nothing else. So, why do people make these moves? There could be different reasons at a given time, but it usually boils down to the fact that they did not realize they were making such a bad move. With this in mind, I wanted to bring the homies two quick questions to ask yourself during your chess games to reduce the number of blunders you make. Alright, so, the two questions I bring to the homies today are the following. When your opponent makes a move, ask question 1. Why did they do that? <laughs> Before making a move of your own, ask question 2. How will my opponent answer this move? So, to show these questions in action, let's go over some examples of when they can be helpful. The first example I want to look at is in an opening commonly known as the Blackburn Shilling Trap. After the moves e4, e5, knight to f3, knight to c6, and bishop to c4, we reach an opening called the Italian Game, and this is a pretty popular opening, so this has a real chance of happening in your games. So now, black has the option of playing knight to d4 to set up the Blackburn shilling trap. Here we can employ the first question. Why did my opponent make this move? It seems strange, because as soon as they did this, it left their pawn on e5 unprotected and ready to be taken. There are two logical explanations for that choice. Either, one, they did not see that their pawn would be left hanging, or two, they want us to take the pawn. Now we can employ question 2 to try and figure out which one it is. If I play my knight on f3 to take the pawn on e5, what will my opponent do next? Let's look at it from the perspective of the black pieces to find out. Take a few seconds to look at this. You can pause your video if you want some extra time and see if you can find the dangerous move black can play to answer us. Alright, as you may have noticed, Black has this banger of a move, queen to g5. The queen is now threatening to take our knight on e5 and our pawn on g2 at the same time, and there is no way to save both, which is why this opening is considered a trap. However, by asking both of our questions, we are able to determine that the pawn is being left unprotected on purpose, and we can avoid the trap in favor of a comfortable lead in peace development. The second example we're going to look at is the surprisingly trappy Sicilian Alapin variation, which is not only a popular opening like the Italian, it is much more solid and respectable than the Blackburn Shilling Trap. The Sicilian Alapin is reached after the moves e4, c5, c3, and there are tons of different ways this game can branch from here. One completely normal way for the move order to continue is for black to play d6, then knight f3, and then we can play knight to f6, attacking the e4 pawn. Here, white has the option to play h3, and it is time to ask our two questions once again. Question 1. Why did they do that? Just like in the last example, our explanations could be that they did not notice or that they want us to take the pawn. However, in this scenario, their move also has come with the added benefits of blocking our knight on f6 and our bishop on c8 from playing to or from plopping into the g4 square. So it is also possible that they either considered this defensive maneuver worth giving up a pawn for, or they were simply too focused on the benefits of that move to consider the unprotected e pawn. Just like last time, we can utilize question 2 to help gain insight into the mind of our opponent. What will our opponent do if we take the e pawn? Let's look from White's perspective to see what they see. Will they develop their bishop on f1? Will they flip the table because they wasted a pawn? Take a few seconds to see if you can find it. Alright, it turns out that our opponent was setting yet another trap for us. If we take the pawn on e4, white has the deadly forking move queen to a5. The queen is attacking our knight and our king at the same time. And since we have no choice but to save our king from check, via, for example, bishop to d7, um, the queen is completely free to gobble up our knight, leaving us with no compensation for our suddenly missing piece. Luckily, we were able to avoid this trap by employing my two quick questions 
to reduce blunders. Alright homies, thank you for watching my chess video on reducing blunders. Let me know you got this far by leaving a comment below that somehow mentions or involves forks, and go ahead and send this to someone who needs to suck a little less at chess. <laughs> See you next week.